Good morning, everyone. This is Saturday, January 14, 2017. We welcome you to our Bible study from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent in the United States of America. And today, our moderator is Shardy from Pennsylvania. Good morning. I'll begin by reading an excerpt from the annual meeting, 1906, in Miscellany, by Mary Baker Eddy. Quote, with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm were the children of Israel delivered from the bondage of the Egyptians. But this deliverance did not put them in possession of the promised land. An unknown wilderness was before them, and that wilderness must be conquered. The law was given that they might know what was required of them, that they might have a definite rule of action whereby to order aright the affairs of daily life. Obedience to the demands of the law revealed the God of their fathers, and they learned to know him. During their sojourn in the wilderness, they suffered defeats and met with disappointments, but they learned from experience and finally became willingly obedient to the voice of their leader. The crossing of the Jordan brought them into the promised land, and this experience was almost as marvelous as had been the passage of the Red Sea 40 years before. In obedience to the command of Joshua, 12 stones were taken from the midst of the river, were set up on the other side for a memorial. In future generations, when it was asked, What mean ye by these stones? It was told them, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Very appropriate. Shall we start with question one? Oh, no. We're going to do it. The topic is, He wholly followed the Lord. And then we'll do uh, the readings from Joshua 14. And then question number one. Who are Joshua and Caleb? Joshua was the son of Nun, who was Moses' minister. And he was also, when, when Moses passed on, the Lord gave Joshua the commission of leading the children of Israel to the promised land. Also, uh, Joshua and Caleb were the only, they were um, uh, two of the 12 spies that Moses had sent in to uh, check out the land of Canaan. And they were the only two that re- reported that they should go and take the land, where the other uh, ten were very afraid. These two supported going over there and making it their own. Thank you. And Joshua really assisted Moses to this. Yeah, and Joshua was the warrior. Joshua fought all these battles and won them. Um, He was quite a fierce warrior, and and it was needed at that time to have that being able to be a good general, if you will, a a warrior. warrior. Uh, We don't hear that Caleb had that assignment. I also read that that Moses had given Joshua his name. His name was Hosea, and he gave his him the name of Joshua, which means in Hebrew, the Lord is salvation. And it said that this was like um, a precursor, or or a, kind of like the Christ coming back in in the Old Testament. Thank you. What does Caleb mean? All heart. 
he was called his bad, that he fully followed the Lord six times in the Old Testament. I also read that the word Caleb means dog. Which isn't too complimentary, but... <laughs> So what does it mean to wholly follow the Lord? Well, Matthew Henry said that he had a full conviction of the truth of what he said and a firm belief of the divine promise. Yes. Well, to actually listen uh, to be in touch with God, I mean, to listen to his leading and to his and to what to do. Yeah, and it's more than yeah. that, isn't it? It's to totally trust your spiritual sense. Yeah. It's to obey what you feel God is telling you and never fear the consequences. I was reading, I thought this was interesting where someone was saying that faith is not positive thinking, it's not optimism. It's not looking on the bright side. It is simply acting on what God says. It's obedience. That's what faith is. So if you're sitting there, oh my gosh, I gotta have faith, I gotta have faith, I gotta have faith. No, you gotta get up and obey God is what you have to do. Maybe that takes some faith to do it, but step out, step forward. Maybe it's more courage. Moral courage. Yeah. Well, nobody thinks of faithful as just sitting there. <laughs> so. Exactly. But many people will say that they don't have faith, therefore they, you know, they can't do this and they can't do that. Well, that's baloney. It is. That's a that's a nice that's a excuse. It's an excuse, right? I think um, that's why it's tested when things seem rough, because otherwise, I mean, if everything is fine, how how would you know that you really trust God? Exactly. So, um, someone mentioned about the uh, 12 spies and uh, Joshua and Caleb being the ones that um, said, let's go, you know, into the promised land. And uh, But the other 10 were very fearful and wanted to go back to Egypt because they thought that was safe. Something they knew. So, the result of that was, uh, because I think it only took them a few months to go from Egypt to the Promised Land. You know, we hear the 40 years, but frankly, they got there, I think, in a couple months. So, not that long. Um, but uh, after the spies came back, and 10 of them said, you know, we're, we're all very scared, we want to go back to Egypt. Um, that's when they wandered around for 40 years. So, if you think about it, Joshua and Caleb um, they were very faithful. They were obedient. Um, and uh, um, here, what was the result of their obedience? Well, 40 years of wandering around in the desert. And so when we think about wholly following the Lord, I mean, they they must have known something. They had something that uh, I don't have, but... Uh, you know, they're following the Lord, and uh, they're doing the right thing, but yet they're wandering around the wilderness for decades. Thank you. I read that they, they had ten plagues to overcome before they got to this point, and it reminded me of what we talked about last week about being tested, because you get tested to see if you're um, able to do what God needs done. Yes, and and I read someone who figured this out that I guess there were a million of them, and uh, it took what he was saying 38 years, but 38 to 40 years. He said that would average 73 people died every day. So in other words, as Tom was saying, it was probably a miserable wandering around for the most part, and and a lot of whining as to where is God. But what did God say about Caleb? said, my servant Caleb, he said he was, because he was imbued with a different spirit and remained loyal to, 
to me, him will I bring into the land, and his offspring as well shall hold possession. What What is that different spirit? That's what Tom was talking about. And Joshua had it too, obviously. Sometimes I think about the incident about the 12 spies going in. These two saw the divine vision. Well, the other ten were concerned about their personal capabilities. And I think that Joshua and Caleb weren't concerned about their personal capabilities, but rather what God's plan were, and knew that he would do it through their obedient, his obedient servants, which they submitted themselves to be. That's why they came in with a report. Totally against everybody else, Obviously, they held on to that spirit. Yes, yes, it was certainly obedience, but they had the spirit of Christ. They had the spirit of the divine mind. All this other stuff was what? Fear, which is what? Not having trust in God. Which is what? Operating the the human human mind. The human Human mind. 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 It is the human mind, so-called. The spirit that Caleb had and Joshua had was the spirit of God, the spirit of the divine mind. That's why he said they were loyal to him. They refused to believe the testimony of the physical senses. They refused to be discouraged. They saw the possibilities. I read uh, in one of the commentaries where the word crisis in Chinese has um, two pictures. You know how they make those pictures in Chinese. The first picture meant danger, and the second picture meant opportunity. So where everyone else just saw the danger, um, Joshua and Caleb saw the opportunity. Now this applies to you right here and right now. You want to know why some people move ahead in life, some people have joy, some people uh, have victories. It, it largely depends on your the spirit within you. If you have a woe is me negative concept of life, you are going to wander and wander forever. Now, Joshua, as Tom just said, Joshua and Caleb were subject to that wandering for 40 years. And before those 40 years, where were they? In Egypt? Yes, 40 years in Egypt. That couldn't have been a lot of fun. In in slavery in Egypt. So that meant 40 and 40 is how much? 80. 80 years of testing. So don't tell me, don't give me any whining, please. 80 years. I was telling Gary, you know, we, we were in this church with all that we went through with the law case and everything. It was close to 40 years. Sometimes I would ask, how long, Lord? So please, no whining in the streets. They endured 80 years. And they were tested, I'm sure, to the nth degree, but they had the spirit in them. They knew God loved them. There was something different about them. They persevered. They persisted. They never gave up. This is a hugely important story for you. And we had uh, covered this story once before, and it was the 12, 12 that went out to spy, and Joshua and Caleb came back, and the other ones came back and said that it was a land of giants. And I thought at the time it was just those people's other vision, but uh, something I found in this study is that it, actually the Anakims were a race of giants, and uh, so that even goes to show more the face of Joshua and Caleb, because they saw giant people too, but they knew with the Lord that they could overcome that obstacle. Yes. Do you want me to read the watch now, because that was about the Anak? Right, yes. I I'd asked, I knew there was a watching point about this, and I asked Linda to find it for me, which she did. Um, 
Go ahead, Linda. All right, it's watch 137. Watch lest you accept divine mind as power that heals the sick and fail to demonstrate it as a source of infallible wisdom as well. In Mark 1, 44, we read of the man whom the master instructed to say nothing to any man about his being healed. The man disobeyed and published it widely, showing that he accepted the divine mind which Jesus reflected as the healing power, but not as the source of wisdom. Yet if mine is the one, it surely is the other. The children of Israel accepted the power of God as that which could heal, sustain, and protect them, as well as help them to conquer their enemies. Yet they often rejected God's wisdom. When they came to the promised land, they were held back through fear of the children of Anak and declared that they were in their own sight as grasshoppers. Had they accepted the wisdom of God, they would have penetrated this trick of animal magnetism, realizing that in reality their own enemy was their own fear and their acceptance of mental suggestion, trying to belittle their conception of themselves. The children of Anak represented animal magnetism attempting to retard their progress through deception and suggestion. The promised land comes through Christian science, but you cannot pass the children of Anak or handle animal magnetism without divine understanding and wisdom." End quote. Thank you. I remember years ago when we first got this watching point, what a huge effect it had on me. Well, I remember it to this day. Think about it. It always met I'm trying to trick you into believing it's powerful, it's a giant, just as David and Goliath, to get you afraid and fearful. It's never what it seems to be. Go back to the story of the use, in the Eustace book about the magician and the psychologist. It, it's, it's hypnotism. And that is a basic point in science. Now, most people don't understand that, but... You see, Caleb and Joshua had the spirit of God in them, and, the, and as did David and Daniel and uh, these others in the Old Testament. So they knew not to be afraid, whatever the challenges were. And they persisted, they survived, they didn't get sick and die, like all the rest were. And you don't either. This is my point. You don't either. So what... What are you feeling like you're a grasshopper and something else is some big giant? What is it that keeps you afraid and in, in a position that's basically unholy, one of fear, one of doubt? What is it? And why don't you challenge it with your science, with your sword in hand? If you have this negative view of life and you're unwilling to obey God, you will always be wandering in the wilderness. Tell you, learn. Someone was saying at the round table, what was it, the, the Groundhog Day, I think it was Janet, the Groundhog Day, that movie where the same thing kept happening over and over and over and over until in that case, um, Bill, <laughs> Bill Murray had to change. He had to realize he needed love. So think about it. Do you do you have a spirit? Are you are you do you have a different spirit? Are you loyal to God? Do you wholly follow God, or do you just do it when it's convenient? when everybody else approves. Now, do you follow when you're met with disapproval by friends or family? I think it's that loyalty to God that proves your loyalty to his allness. And Mary, you said earlier, sometimes when we ask how long, I read in Bicknell Young saying that the answer to that is when you, as long as you deny my allness. So it's 
that loyalty to God on this. Good, good answer. <laughs> yeah, you hold, Big Dal Young is clear on that, thank you. Yes, he says you hold yourself back. And we do with our beliefs and our fears, our lack of understanding. There's no reason why we, all of us, can enter into the promised land. But we have to be willing to be tried and tested, never not to give up. And if, and if you have that spirit, even when you're tried and tested, there are so many wonderful lessons to be learned. And it doesn't mean you necessarily have to lose your joy or your enthusiasm. You have to work harder at it to keep it. But you understand really what it is and the sources of God. And if you don't learn those lessons, what if you were just plopped into the promised land? What would what would that be like? Probably wouldn't appreciate it. I know a lot of people who are given things don't appreciate it because they haven't worked for it. And then they and then they drift off and let it go. Absolutely right. You would you, that's right. You wouldn't recognize it as the promised land. You might take it for granted and not be grateful for it. You will still be shaky anyway. So fearful. And you will be. Yeah. You will be, and even, yeah, you wouldn't see it because you're so fearful and negative, you wouldn't have the eyes to see it. I even be complaining about you ended up there. Yeah. This is Eddie says that too. One man hell is another man heaven, or vice versa. Yeah. I, see, I, I see Plainfield as a promised land for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I agree with that. Well, I mean, I, I agree what Plainfield stands for, yes, it's a promised land for me, too. I entered into something quite wonderful, but it certainly hasn't meant that I haven't been tried. And uh, But I had these resources in which to meet the problems with, while before I truly did just wander around wondering what the heck was going on. So Plainfield means both of those. Plain is where the truth is revealed. But field means it's the military battleground where the battle between good and evil is fought and won for good. That's the meaning of playing field. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you. That's wonderful. One thing that uh, you can correct me if this isn't uh, quite right, but one thing that I found here in that playing field is that I need to really when I'm not accomplishing a, a certain understanding of God, I need to break it down into smaller parts. For example, I have been uh, under my practitioner's help trying to overcome the idea that we aren't complete and finished in God's eyes. I've had a hard time uh, believing that, I guess one might say. So finally, what I've taken is the last sentence, in the, or part of the sentence in the scientific statement of being, uh, yeah, that we're not material, we are spiritual. And uh, now I'm trying to just repeat that over and over and over again every time I think about it. It really is helping to move me away from the concept that I'm uh, material. Good. Good. And as, you, and as you meet and overcome each of these challenges each day, whatever they are, you gain step by step your dominion. And it's a step by step understanding of God's allness and of your perfection. You're right. We don't jump there. You know, you don't jump into it right away. But it's a step by step. And, you know, not, not, none of us, as far as I can tell, is there. 100% perfectly now. I, I don't have it all figured out. <laughs> but that's what's so great about our experience here is that it, if we see it correctly, it's a schoolhouse, it's a teaching. And we all are here kind of helping each other along in this step by step growth. Thank God it's step by step because if it was one big giant leap, it would be hard to imagine that I could take it. <laughs> I am grateful. Well, life life is a schoolhouse. I mean, that's what life is. Right. And 
And the beauty of Plainfield should be that it provides the tools with which to take those steps. So this was a, a wonderful chance to get into, especially Caleb. Joshua, we, we seem to know more about, but Caleb perhaps not so much. And he was, oh my gosh, I have such respect for him now after studying more about him. And one thing, Charles Spurgeon, he, he did a sermon about Caleb. And he said, those that follow the Lord fully, even the devil himself will be afraid of you. And that is, to me, tremendous. You give your whole heart, your whole soul, whole everything to God. Huh. Even the devil will be afraid of you. So, of course, we know there is no devil, and that's part of the being a, a whole follower of, of God. You're unafraid of the evil because you know it's not real. And perhaps that's what this false concept fears most for you to understand its unreality, because that is what will defeat it, and it's only that which will defeat it. And you see, this is the great power of Christian science, because I, there are so many good Christians who have done wonderful things, but I don't know of any other um, religion, if you will, that teaches the unreality of error. In fact, we get stopped for that thought. So. That, that is what will defeat it, but you cannot just say it superficially. You've got to have a deep understanding as to why it's nothingness. And the only way you can do that is we learned in the story of David, where he was proving it day by day by day. So when he met Goliath, he had full confidence that it had no power, and he proved it did not. As did Caleb and Joshua, as did, again, all these great Old Testament prophets. There's no reason under the sun why you can't start proving it each day today, overcoming uh, anything that seems distressing to you and proving it's unreality. That's the step-by-step -step process. If you ignore those step-by-step -step process and you just get more and more fearful, we let or discouraged and let it all pile up on you, then you're not making the progress you can and should be. And if something of a more larger nature comes about, you usually just fall over and fall over dead. Not necessary. Um, I love the thought so. of. Go ahead, Lauren. Uh, no, I love the thought of every challenge. You know, you making it into a step on which you stand to see God's allness. Each one a each? step higher. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Who else is trying to speak? Um, so um, I want to say that, uh, you know, I talked about Caleb wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, and then they got to the promised land, and then I think it was like five years he's fighting the, you know, wars in Israel. So um, that, that's a lot of time. He's, I think, about 85 or something like that. So, uh, and he was promised some land. So you would think now that... Uh, after all that he's done, you know, decades wandering around the desert and being faithful, fighting all those wars and, and, and the promised land, you know, that uh, now he's an elderly man and he deserves something because he has promised it. Now everybody's going to take care of him. He's gonna, they're going to put him in the rest home and watch over him and, you know, take care of him now for the rest of his life. Um, but, uh, you know, it said that his strength was the same as it was when he was that spy, the 12 spies. And the land that he asked for was the one where we're talking about, the Anakims, where the giants were. And he said that uh, the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out. So he was not going to any rest home, you know? He was going to go fight the giants. Isn't that wonderful? This is why I love this guy. <laughs> He's fantastic. Talk about debunking the myths of old age. But it's what Florence was saying. He said that you do it step by step, and you don't have to go there. He's 85. He's ready to fight some more giants. Claims the land. He, he, he knows this great promise that God gave him, and, and he also knows if God gives it to him, God will fulfill it. 
he can defeat the Giants, and he did. And some of them, they were like 9 feet tall, 13 feet tall. It's just a wonderful story. My gosh. It's saying, so what's all that in the presence and power of God? No fear. No fear. Beautiful. I was going to read this at the end, but since we're talking about it, uh, Caleb, a uh, quote, this is from a uh, quote, youthfulness lies here in giving our hearts to God and in living for him. Thank you. If you give your all to God, how can it grow old? If you use your voice to glorify and express him, if you use your limbs <laughs> Swift and beautiful for thee. That's why I love that hymn 324. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. It goes in every aspect of your body. If you're using it for God, how can it how can it get old or sick or tired? It can't. It's only when you use it for some other purposes, selfish purposes or hateful or willful or whatever. Give your whole heart and soul to serving him. And then know this truth. Because I, I've heard a couple times this week of people with struggling perhaps with age problems saying, well, I don't believe in old age. Well, it doesn't matter if you don't believe it. Why? The world believes it. The world believes it. The world believes. And if you just think, oh, well, I, I never think about it or I don't believe in it, You've got to handle it, and you've got to be aggressive on the offensive. We were taught here, Mrs. Evans said, early on, you start knowing you're ageless, diseaseless, and deathless because God made me so. And also, you can be an old grump, curmudgeon at age 20 and be vibrant and youthful at age 85, as Caleb was. So... The time has really nothing to do with it. It is your thought. Is there the spirit within you that's different from other people? And what, is, what do we know about Mrs. Betty? She was very spry and, and youthful in her appearance and her demeanor. Yes, she was. And she worked hard every day until the very end. She accomplished a great deal in her 80s. You know, we were at Long Year this past week, the museum, and we met the man who does the DVDs on Mrs. Eddie. And one thing he said, he said one of the most popular DVDs is the, the most recent one, which was her time at Chestnut Hill. And he said he even he was surprised at how active she was because everyone thinks, well, not everyone, but some people are think that she went to Chestnut Hill and retired and just kept quiet. Well, she might have been more quiet, but she was not resting. In fact, she and she also came up upon so many of her trials when the um, next friend suit. Um, she, but she formed the monitor then. She was extremely active, very active. And when it was time for her to leave, she walked out. And when they did, what do they call it, the autopsy or whatever on her, mm -hmm. they said she had a body of a young woman. All her organs, her skin, everything, and not deteriorated. And the guy that, you know, was that, he was not a Christian scientist. So, and if it's provable once, it's provable many times. And here, another case of it is Caleb. Thank you, Tom. And I guess we should go on. We've already talked about some of these things, but thanks. Okay. Sure. Before we go on, I want the, what you quoted, which I think is the nugget of the whole lesson uh, here, is that he had a different spirit. That's Numbers 14:24, which is very beautiful. So, okay. Uh, number two, why was Joshua in Gilgal? Once they crossed Jordan, that became like their headquarters. 
That's where they camped when they crossed the Jordan. Isn't that where he was to divide up and assign the land to the tribes of Israel? As, as God directed? Yeah, and that's where we, he set up the 12 stones, which we already read about from the annual meeting of 1906 in Mithraim. Monument of Israel. They crossed the Jordan on dry ground. It was a, a wonderful achievement. And for those of you who haven't uh, looked at the forum, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful things on the forum, and Jeremy went into Mrs. Eddy's definitions of the 12 tribes. And want to speak to that? Sure. I have a lot of papers for today. <laughs> but, uh, Never ready. <clears throat> Doesn't feel good not to be ready. So. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was. The longer I'm here, the more I look at what Jesus says. It's not just he wasn't just stating like, you no. Know, he was being symbolic a lot of times. So when I when he talked about you shall sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes, it got me thinking. You know, well, what does that mean symbolically? So, um, and and Mrs. Eddie's definitions in the glossary of at least the ones that she did for um, Jacob's son were quite interesting, all the different things. But they just seem to be a complete list of things you have to watch for, good and bad. Uh, and very fascinating. Yeah, so you can, if you haven't, looked on the forum and read these it's states and stages of, of thought. And, uh, it's very interesting. Useful. It's very useful, yes. And tomorrow we'll get into Linda found last week I talked about Charles Spurgeon and how he became the preacher he is or I was and the verse from Isaiah about look unto to me the Lord is saying look unto me all ye ends of and be saved all ye ends of the earth and she found the actual lecture and put it up on the forum which is extremely helpful. Yeah, so they, thank you. Talk about that tomorrow. Yes, thank you. If you watch the movie about him, Charles Spurgeon, the people's preacher, was given. I paraphrased it last week, but she found it so, and posted it. Thank you, Linda. So, and the other thing I found that Gilgal gal means rolled away, and the commentary said that you're rolling away the past. They rolled away their past with their time in Egypt. We all have to roll away our past, don't we? Give it away. You can't keep go dropping in and visiting your past, especially if you think it was miserable. That does you a lot of good, doesn't it? And yet, how, how many people do that? Go ahead. Something that kind of relates to this is that said that besides Joshua, um, Caleb was the oldest man in Israel and 20 years older than all the others. So it's like that whole generation of false beliefs were left behind, and it was this new thought that was going into the promised land. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, there's this scientific thing. What is it, the survival of the fittest? Well, <laughs> those who have the, the spirit in them of God they're the ones, I mean, this is a supreme case of who survived and who didn't. So one of the fruit of the spirit is long-suffering, and that's what I was thinking when you were talking about that before. Yes, long-suffering. And, you know, fairly uh, readings on patients, two people said how much they needed that. Well, you've got to know that Caleb and, and Joshua had extreme patience. Sometimes you just have to be willing to wait. Don't demand your reward. Say, I, I've been good for two days, now I demand my reward. You just keep on trucking. That was the name of one of the commentaries, I think. It was called Keep on Trucking. <laughs> Caleb kept on trucking, <laughs> which he did. And even when he wanted that land, it was for his next challenge. It wasn't 
<laughs> yes. Back. It wasn't. It wasn't just given to him. So let's get in. And we answered the one about Yonko. I think that's good enough. Um, that's where the sun stopped when they left Gilgal and went on to the seven, you know, to the fight. Uh, I thought that was interesting. But let's do three and four together. Okay. Why did Caleb ask for Hebron as an inheritance? And why did Joshua grant Caleb's request? Well, God said that was where he was going, and he certainly earned it with his good report and all his work since then. That was 40 years late earlier, but it still held true. So he stood up for what was right, otherwise it would have just gone into the pool of the rest of the land and gotten divided amongst everybody else. Thank you. And that would have been disrespectful of God's plan. Thank you. That's so yeah. true. God and had promised it to him I because of it. because of how how he uh, went there. And you know, the, it says is I think it's a hymn. God's promises are kept. Sometimes you have to stake your claim because I know myself. Well, that healing was always way way in the distance. And I never, Mrs. Evans would tell me, you've got to demand that you be healed now. Stop thinking it's some future thing. You stake your claim. And he went through all this 80 years, actually, so it was certainly time for him to stake his claim. That, you certainly know by his spirit that his doing so was not an arrogant or selfish request. Thank you. Yes. No, it was. It was. It was quite a few uh, beautiful passages where he was talking about um, how it was promised and what he had done and ahead, that it them. wasn't done out of a, um, it was done with humility. Read them, Betty. Um, let's see if I can find here. Oh. Four years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Thank you. It was this holy being with God that enabled him to do this. He knew those three things from Christ Jesus. I and my Father are one. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, and the Father has not left me alone. And he knew whatever God said would happen, and he trusted him implicitly. And he, he knew this wonderful promise of God. He never forgot it. He knew it was his. His whole life was God-centered. And Joshua knew it. And Joshua knew it. That's why Joshua said yes. 
the flesh, of course, because Joshua was a very godly man himself. It's all part of God's plan. So many of you, you know, you travel through difficult times. Sometimes what you need to do then is, is to take your claim and know God's promises are kept. They do come. Don't be surprised when they come, when you've been faithful. Mrs. Eddy wrote, I make big demands on love. When you're motivated by divine love, make big, make big demands. For God's sake, think personal or selfish. Oh, not in God, really. Pardon me? It's honoring God. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It is. It is. There was a, a quote I liked in Matthew Henry. He said, whatever we undertake, God's favorable presence with us is all in all to our success. This, therefore, we must earnestly pray for and care, carefully make sure of by keeping ourselves in the love of God. And on this we must depend, and from this take our encouragement against the greatest difficulties. I also, he also wrote, a singular piety shall be crowned with a singular favor. So, did God favor uh, Caleb more than other people? No, it's an open fount to all. He just is accessing it. Thank you. He did well what said. He takes. Very good. Well said. It's open, open fount to all, but he was accessing it by his total obedience, giving himself wholly to the Lord. So he seemed like he got a tremendous favor, and this can make mortal mind jealous. Well, why did why does God like him more than me, or why did they do what? And I'm a Christian scientist, and it didn't happen to me, and all of this, rah, rah, rah. Better shut up that voice. Do you ever expect to get anything? But he deserved it. He deserved it. He earned it. And also, he deserved it in God's eyes. People use throw this word deserving around back and forth very carelessly all too often based on their selfish preferences and not or human opinions. Human opinions. Yeah, yeah. I read too that one of the you know, he had to go in and he had to conquer these giants and I guess one of the, the cities that or suffer or whatever it's called. It had built a very strong defense. There was an outer wall and then an inner wall, and between the outer wall and the inner wall, there was this huge maze with blind alleys. So they had to get through all that, and they did. And they conquered the giants. Ready for the battle, even though, as Tom said, the other people would be in a nursing home. What a horrible thing, nursing home. <laughs> Yes, it's horrible. <laughs> Don't ever think you're going there. Not that, you know, we have great love and compassion for anyone that is there, but uh, no, you've got God's work to do. We expect to go for many, 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 many years. As long as God needs you on this earth to do it, you will be here. And when it's time for you to go, you should walk out. So, okay, there's the doorbell. There's the doorbell. <laughs> Let him open the door. So let's see. We have one more. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit. Hebron's very interesting why Caleb was so interested in, in having it um, being. And he, so if anybody wanted to say just a few things before we end. I think so. What is I read, the Go ahead, yeah. I read that Sarah was buried there, 
and also a cave near there is where Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac were buried. So it had some it had a significance to him as well. Yes, it had all this wonderful biblical history was where Abraham built his altar, where the co covenant was given. Um, that evoked um, any wonderful memories in the minds of God's people. And David was anointed king of Israel there. Oh. Where Abraham made friends with the Amorites, and then they went up and saved Lot. Where there was the best piece of real estate in Canaan. <laughs> also, <laughs> it was it was beautiful. It was a high elevation. It, you know, you saw the huge... Because they, they brought home these huge loads of humongous grapes and fruit and all kinds of things. Wonderful agriculture, um, but just had one slight problem. It was inhabited by giants. <laughs> it was a strategic a crossroads between the Dead Sea to the east, Jerusalem to the north, Egypt to the south, and the coastal plain. referred to as a royal city as well as city of refuge. Oh. And Caleb was one that deserved it because he actually, when he scouted out the land, he did he found it and saw it, but he was undismayed by the giants. He was that was nothing in the eyes of God. So you can ask yourself, how would you have um if, or, and how are you now? Are you are you are you believing in a in a Goliath? So it's a powerful story, and one there's so many lessons to it. And remember, you're deserving, if you've been faithful and wholly given yourself to the Lord, you're deserving of the best real estate in Canaan. Why not? But if you haven't been faithful, or if that's what you're seeking, if you're if you're just seeking the the material thing, then you don't deserve anything. You must, your whole purpose is to seek the Lord thy God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, as did Caleb. Anyone else? I really like that business about staking one's claim, because I saw it as a uh, parable of first they were afraid of the giants, and then cross into Canaan, then Caleb wanted to take on the uh, giants to finish the job, and uh, interestingly enough, according to one side note I found by accident, it turns out that Goliath, because some of the giants did escape the gas in such areas, so then Goliath was the uh, offspring of them, so it's this always repeating and defeating, and uh, by staking the claim, then we can put an end to it. Yeah. Yeah. I also read that um, it's it's a shame that Nabal, later on, a, a descendant of Caleb, probably got part of it, which the history was not good with Nabal. Of Abigail's first husband? Yeah. All right. Thank you. It's interesting how all this history ties in. Is there anything more, Tom, you wanted to say? I guess not. Still there, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well. All right, Shardy, did you want to end it with anything? Just to say, let's give our hearts to God and live for Him. Thank you. This was an honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.